The Kingdom of the Western Franks was created by the Treaty of Verdun in 843, and members of the Carolingian dynasty reigned within that territory until the late 10th century. As anointed kings, their authority, like that of their Cape Tion successors, had a sacramental quality that was acknowledged by the princes who ruled in significant centers of power such as Normandy, Burgundy, Anjou, Poitou, and Toulouse. Aquitaine, however, had ceased to be part of the West Frankish kingdom in the early 10th century, and Brittany was entirely independent. Cape Tion and Carolingian rulers conceded the nobility's right to run their own territories in return for loyalty and military assistance when needed. Despite these agreements between kings and nobles, disputes concerning land and influence nonetheless recurred between the monarchy and the effectively independent dynasts. As a result, the king's unfettered authority was confined to their personal fiefdom or domain in the Isle de France, an area of the Middle Seine centered on Paris and Bourges where the Capetians actually owned land. The primacy accorded these regis francorum was therefore often merely ceremonial, and until the 13th century they struggled to assert themselves. The Cape Tion monarchy eventually persuaded the nobility that solidarity with the crown was in their own best interests and a more cohesive governing elite emerged as a result. But the evolution of a widespread national identity was a very long-term development in medieval France, as in other parts of continental Europe. The loyalties and identities of the great mass of the population were local and particular rather than general and uniform. Linguistic profusion emphasized further the plurality of cultures which barely communicated with each other. If the North was the land of the Long D'Oil, it was the Long D'O.C. that predominated in the South, and out of these two broad linguistic groups there emerged several distinctive dialects, such as Norman and Burgundian, Provençal and Languedocian. Middle French also existed by the 14th century, but this standardized language made few inroads in the South. The Carolingian succession had been usurped on two occasions before the reign of Louis V, the last member of his family to rule in West Francia with Odo of Paris and Robert the first reigning as kings in 888 to 898 and 922 to 923 respectively. Hugh, the Duke of the Franks, belonged to the same family, and his father Robert, the Great had been guardian of Lothair the fourth's estates during the king's minority. Surnames had yet to be established as a general convention in 10th century Europe, and Hugh Capet owed his nickname to the headship or authority he enjoyed among the nobility who elected him to succeed Louis V in June 987. That prestige came to signify the start of a new phase in the history of kingship in West Francia, and the Cape Tion dynasty would go on to acclaim Hugh as its eponymous founder. Hugh's claim to the throne was supported by his cousin Otto II. That family connection had deep roots, since the Capetians' Robertine ancestors had originally been members of the East Frankish nobility before establishing themselves in West Francia by the mid-9th century. As crowned Roman emperors, the Etonian dynasty could nominate West Francia's senior clergy, and these placemen enforced their patron's policy by refusing to back the later Carolingian rulers of the Western Kingdom. Adalbaran, the Archbishop of Reims, was one such nominee and his support for Hugh Capet had been crucial at the Assembly of 987. Although Charles of Lorraine had a legitimate Carolingian claim to succeed the childless Louis V, it was not difficult to find reasons why he should be denied a crown. He had falsely accused Lothair's queen of infidelity with the Bishop of Léon, and after being driven from the kingdom, he paid homage to Otto II, who made him Duke of Lower Lorraine in 977. In the autumn of 978, an invasion force led by Otto and Charles compelled Lothair to retreat to Paris where he was besieged until Hugh Capet's army stepped in and drove the invaders back across the frontier. Charles's ambitions did not cease on Hugh Capet's accession to the throne, however, and he managed to take both Reims and Léon before he was seized in the spring of 991, after which he died in captivity. Hugh's determination to secure a dynastic succession meant that Robert II was elected king during his father's lifetime. But he had argued that the succession needed to be established because he was planning a campaign against the Arab forces that were threatening Borel II, the Count of Barcelona. Hugh may well have seen an opportunity here for an extension of his power, but the nobility refused to support him and the military offensive never materialized. Such an inability to enforce the royal will illustrates the real limits to Hugh's power as well as explaining the king's anxious eagerness to get his son confirmed as his successor. 
In 1023, Robert II and the German Emperor Henry II arrived at a landmark decision. They resolved not to pursue claims to each other's territories. Although an agreed boundary between the French Kingdom and the German Empire was now in place, this early phase of Cape Dion history remained one of dynastic insecurity. Possessed of so few lands of his own, Robert pursued his rights to any feudal territories that became vacant. However, the fact that these were invariably also contested by other claimants embroiled him in numerous military campaigns. He tried to invade Burgundy in 1003, but it took another 13 years before the church recognized his title as the duchy's ruler. Furthermore, the civil wars waged against him by his own sons were prolonged and bitter struggles centered on inheritance rights. The dynastic style meant that Hugh Magnus was crowned a king in his father's lifetime, and from 1017 onward, he was co-ruler. But although earmarked for great things, he rebelled against Robert II, and after his early death in 1025, the two surviving brothers continued with the campaign. When Henry succeeded to the throne, Robert maintained his dissidence until he was given the dukedom of Burgundy. In an age that was accustomed to violence, Robert I of Burgundy remained notable for his uncontrollable behavior. He set aside his wife Healy of Seymour in 1046 and then killed her father. The question of how to deal with the increasingly powerful Duchy of Normandy preoccupied both Henry I and his two immediate successors. Henry had helped Duke William to assert his authority internally in 1047, when he was threatened by rebel vassals. However, William's marriage to Matilda, daughter of the Count of Flanders, threatened the French crown with a pincer-like alliance, and the two military campaigns that Henry launched in 1054 and 1057 sought to subjugate the duchy. These ended in an unsurprising failure, and Philip I reconciled himself to the reality of Norman power by making peace. The reign of Louis VI nevertheless saw resumption of the Franco-Norman conflict and a dramatic improvement in the fortunes of French monarchy, along with a vigorous assertion of royal rights. By the end of the 11th century, large areas of the Cape Tion domain in the Isle de France were controlled by feudal lords who ignored their duties of vassalage and exercised an independent power by illegal and violent means. Although the military campaigns fought by Louis on his own lands lasted some quarter of a century, he had succeeded in reasserting his feudal rights by the 1130s, and orderly government was restored in the royal domain. Louis's foreign policy was just as strenuous, and here he could take advantage of a split within the Norman elite when William Cleto, the son of Robert Curthose, Duke of Normandy, rebelled against his uncle Henry I and sought to replace him as ruler of both England and Normandy. In 1124, Louis's army and its allies won a great victory over the forces of Henry V. This martial success recalled Hugh Capet's prestige and earned Louis his acclamation as the second founder of his dynasty's authority. An arranged marriage between Louis's infant son and Eleanor of Aquitaine meant that the French crown was, for a while, reunited with the Duchy of the Southwest. That union nonetheless proved to be one of history's most significant mesalliances because, following her divorce, Eleanor married Henry, Count of Anjou. Henry's accession to the throne of England as Henry II therefore created the vast power block of the Angevin Empire. In theory, Henry held Normandy and Anjou as a vassal of the French monarchy and, since he had married Eleanor without seeking his suzerain's permission, Louis declared war on him. Subsequent defeats showed how much greater were the resources available to Henry, but if Louis could not compete in that particular theater of war, his pro-papal policies gave him a more positive role on the European stage. At the start of his reign, he had rejected the papal nominee to the Archbishopric of Bourges, and Louis's territories had therefore been placed for a while under a papal interdict. His intervention in the great quarrel between Pope Alexander II and the German Emperor Frederick, the first Barbarossa, nonetheless, showed the depth of Louis's attachment to the papal cause. Alexander had been elected pope by a majority of the College of Cardinals, but the minority who supported Cardinal Octavian broke away and elected him as Pope Victor IV. This anti-pope and his two successors enjoyed Barbarossa's support. In the years of Alexander III's exile in 1162 to 1165 were spent in France where he enjoyed Louis's warm support. The alliance between the church and the French crown deepened as a result, and the strong identification of the French clergy with the monarchy gave Louis a chain of command that enabled his will to be imposed in areas far from the core royal domain. 
The fact that both Louis VI and Louis VII survive in the documentary records as real personalities owes much to the pen of the Abbe Suger of St. Denis, who was a significant courtier by the late 1120s and the monarchy's chief advisor from the mid-1130s until his death. He wrote a history of Louis VII's reign as well as a detailed account of the governmental machinery, and these works in turn inspired the monks of St. Denis to embark on the chronicles that give a quasi-official account of the development of the French national monarchy during the 12th century. The challenges facing the kings remained enormous, and Louis VII's participation in the fiasco of the Second Crusade, which had to be abandoned in 1148, undermined the royal finances. But in other respects, there was a real change of gear with the city of Paris evolving both culturally and economically. The commercial quarter known as Les Halles started to operate on the right bank of the Seine during Louis V.I.'s reign. The marshes on the left bank were drained, and this area became the heart of a celebrated academic quartier. The problem of the succession had long tormented Louis VII in a manner entirely typical of his Cape Dion forebears. Eleanor had borne him two daughters, as did his second wife Constance of Castile. It was his third wife, Adele of Champagne, who gave him the son and heir that he craved, however. In 1179, during the last year of his father's life, Philip II Augustus was crowned at Reims in a ceremony whose precautionary nature would have been well understood by Hugh Capet. The Abbey of St. Denis was a Merovingian foundation, and it was therefore already ancient when Suger decided that the Romanesque structure had to be rebuilt. Suger was the first of the ecclesiastical statesmen who rose to greatness in the service of the French crown. During the five years following his election as abbot in 1122, Suger devoted most of his time to the administration of St. Denis, and the extensive account he wrote of the building project also places the abbey in its historical context. As a center of learning, a royal necropolis and ceremonial setting, the abbey had reflected the policies and supported the interests of successive Regis Francorum. If St. Denis was to remain relevant at the highest levels of government, it needed to have a contemporary look, and for Suger that inevitably meant adopting the Gothic style. Suger was also a loyal servant to the monarchy, and his work at St. Denis had aims similar to those of contemporary French kingship. In both cases, the institution's past was being repackaged in order to secure its place in the future. By this time, the principles of Gothic architecture typified by soaring spires Lofty rib vaults and pointed arches were being adopted by many of northern France's ecclesiastical foundations, and St. Denis would join the ranks of the Gothic masterpieces erected in Chartres, Léon, Bourges, and Reims. Gothic architecture's realization involved complex building plans, material wealth, and a well-organized labor force, and the building projects reflected the self-belief of the ecclesiastical and courtly elite who were in overall charge. The fact that 12th century summers were also proving to be unusually long and warm was an added bonus, and as a result the masons who labored on site had more time to get the work done. The building of Notre Dame on the Isle de la site from 1163 onward was a particularly spectacular example of the organizational capacity and self-confidence of the French monarchy. Maurice de Sully was the bishop who oversaw the work's initial phase, and he also started the building of the Hotel Dieu a hospital that stood adjacent to Notre Dame. The Norman conquest of the English people is an event without parallel in both the history of England and of medieval Europe as a whole. No more than 10,000 knights enforced a policy of military subjugation and wholesale expropriation of land in the former Anglo-Saxon kingdom during the generation that followed the Battle of Hastings in 1066, with the leaders of the native population being excluded from public office because of their ethnicity. Often brutal, the conquest of England by the Normans was also efficient and wide-ranging, changing forever the systems of government, social structure, and culture. The Anglo-Saxon kingdom had been one of the glories of Europe's Christian civilization. When the Viking ancestors of the Normans were starting to penetrate the lower Seine Valley in 900, Anglo-Saxon culture was already ancient. Its leaders could count among their ancestors royal saints and martyrs who were venerated across the continent and whose witness testified to the sacred nature of the authority that emanated from England's throne. Neighboring powers admired the royal house of Wessex, England's reigning dynasty since the late 9th century, and marveled at the efficiency of the tax-collecting bureaucracy that enriched English kings. 11th century Europe supplied abundant examples of native populations subjected to the cruelty and violence of a conquering invader. But they were all pagans 
whereas the Anglo-Saxons shared with the Normans the Christian faith. What happened in England during the second half of the 11th century was therefore unprecedented, since it took place within Christendom. Contemporaries noted this fact, and there were also papal protests, but all to no avail. How and why, therefore, did the Normans get away with it? It was the Franks who gave the Nord Manny their first opportunity by ceding them lands around the mouth of the Seine in 911. From this base, they extended their grip westward to Normandy, which soon became one of the most tightly controlled feudal states in Europe. Conversion to Christianity and adoption of cavalry warfare did not remove the piratical restlessness that formed part of the Norman Scandinavian inheritance. The Norman readiness to learn, adapt, and assimilate gave them a swift command over conquered territories. Their evolution of the Mott and Bailey Castle, a mound surrounded by a ditched enclosure, invariably marked the Normans' implacable territorial penetration. Their championing of religious orthodoxy was typically authoritarian, but their support for Benedictine monasticism, especially the foundations at Beck and Cannes, turned Normandy into a pioneering center of 11th century scholarship. Norman interest in England dated back to 1002, when Ethelred II married Emma, the daughter of Normandy's Duke Richard. But contemporary Scandinavia had a longer tradition of pursuing ambitions in England. Alfred the Great, King of Wessex, had contained the Danish Viking raiders and then consolidated his authority as ruler right across the English south and west. A century later, however, the Danes resumed their offensive, and the Danish king Nut became king of England after Ethelred's death in 1016. English, Norman, and Scandinavian positioning ensued. Nut's marriage to the widowed Emma solidified his power base, but their son Harthacnut died after a brief reign. Ethelred and Emma's son Edward had spent long years in exile after joining his maternal relatives in Normandy. His accession to the English throne in 1042 restored the line of Anglo-Saxon kings, albeit with a Norman slant, and Edward, the confessor, proved a good patron to the many Norman clergy, soldiers, and officials who traveled with him from the duchy to the English court. This clique aroused the antagonism of Earl Godwine, England's preeminent aristocrat, who forced the king to dismiss his Norman advisers in 1053. When Edward died without issue at the beginning of 1066, the English aristocracy chose the Earl's son and successor Harold Godwin's son as king, and he was duly crowned. Harold III Hardrada, king of Norway, therefore pursued a claim to the throne, and Harold of England's estranged brother tossed to Godwin's son, the Earl of Northumbria, supported him. Harold's army gained a great victory over the invading Norwegian army at the Battle of Stamford Bridge near York on September 25, 1066, in the course of which Tostig and Harold Hardrada were killed. Having marched south from Yorkshire to Sussex, the English army was already exhausted when it fought the battle that was joined at Hastings on October 14, and which ended in Harold's defeat and death. The English aristocracy immediately chose Edgar Atheling to succeed Harold so William still had to fight his way to the crown. He failed to take London at his first attempt from the east, after which he advanced on the capital from the northwest before eventually receiving the submission of the English aristocracy at Berkhamsted. The coronation of William as England's new king took place at Westminster Abbey on December 25, 1066. It was the prelude to a series of campaigns of subjugation. In 1067 rebels in Ken attacked Dover Castle, and a revolt spread in West Mercia. In 1068, William had to negotiate the surrender of Exeter, and there were further revolts both in Mercia and in Northumbria. Harold's sons were meanwhile raiding the West Country from their new bases in Ireland, and in 1069, a rebellion spread in Northumbria after the massacre of several hundred Norman soldiers garrisoned at Durham. William defeated the Northern rebels in battle near York before pursuing the remnants into the city, many of whose inhabitants were then massacred. The arrival of a large Danish fleet off England's eastern coast in the late summer of 1069 inspired widespread English dissidents, and an allied Northumbrian Danish army defeated the Norman garrison at York before establishing control over Northumbria. William stopped the Danish penetration into Lincolnshire, and after retaking York he bought off the Danes, who agreed to leave England by the spring of 1070. William's army then waged a relentless campaign of devastation across Northumbria in the winter of 1069 to 1070 resulting in a death toll of around 150,000. The following spring saw the conqueror established in Chester, from where he crushed remaining areas of Mercian resistance. 
Eastern England saw further resistance, since the Danes initially reneged on their assurances to leave. However, a further payment finally secured their departure. Deprived of Danish support, the rebels were crushed in 1071. Wherever they went, Norman knights wanted two things, land and titles. Those who were prominent in the English campaign were of higher birth than their compatriots who went to southern Italy, and their surnames often reflected the family fiefdoms they already held in Normandy. In an unusual move, William claimed personal possession of all English land, and this meant he could dispose of it as he saw fit. The territories of English nobles who had fought and died with Harold were redistributed among William's supporters. The pattern of confiscations explains the persistence of major anti-Norman revolts that led in turn to even more confiscations during 1067 to 1071. Where a landholder died without issue, William and his barons claimed the right to choose the heir, who tended to be Norman, while widows and daughters who inherited property were often made to marry Norman husbands. William distributed his land grants so that an individual's holdings were spread throughout the country. A noble who revolted would therefore find it difficult to defend all his territories simultaneously, and the system encouraged group solidarity by bringing the nobility into contact with each other rather than retreating into a regional power base. The loyalty of this elite group meant that William could rule England from Normandy by implementing the practice known as government by writ, and this was the system followed by his Norman successors on the throne. After 1072, the king returned to Normandy since his duchy faced serious external threats, and he visited England on just four further occasions. 